take it away, Fear Dragon. Thank you so much, Jake. Uh, I'm, of course, joined here by Zombie Grub, and we're going to be hopping into our next series, Jon Snow versus Neve. How are you feeling about this, Zombie Grub? Uh, I'm feeling it's going to be a tough matchup for Jon Snow. Yeah. yeah. I think that's say. the general consensus, but here's the thing. I'm going to say that a lot of people sleep on my boy Jon Snow, because Jon Snow, he, is, he has multiple nicknames. God Snow, Money Snow, but one of my favorite is Consistent Snow. Did, did you give him these nicknames? I... No, actually, I think Game Time gave him most oh, of these okay. nicknames, but right. Consistent Snow is one of my favorites because I think it really describes one of the best attributes about Jon Snow is that he's very consistent. We were talking about Masa and how some days he'll show up and you're like, uh, he can be one of these amazing players, but some days he shows up and he doesn't actually have the best performance. Jon Snow just doesn't have bad days. He, like, okay. very, I think it's been years since he's ever really had a bad day. And that's what I really look forward to. But the problem yeah. is he also doesn't exactly have exceptional days. Right. And that's what I think you need versus me. Yes, that is definitely true. Um, I think Neve's definitely the contender to win this. Again, maybe even without dropping a map might be the ideal situation for him, right? Um, but I think that you're absolutely right, John. So, like, every time I've gotten to watch him, whether it's online or offline, it's like he kind of does what, what would you would expect, right? Not the exceptional days, but it means you see him steadily improve throughout the years, especially throughout the last couple of months. He's seriously trying to be the contender for the next, you know, uh, like, I guess, best American, I suppose, as he is from the USA. We had a Canada-Canada match, and now we have USA versus USA. Yeah, and not only that, but you were just talking about how just over the years we've seen John so again, kind of rising up in the scene very consistently. That's kind of the way that you would describe his career path. He has been that player that for over five years, six years, he has just slowly been making his way one step at a time up the ladder. And then you compare him to Neve, who's almost the exact opposite. Yeah, he was playing Terran a while ago, but hmm. he switched to Protoss, and just suddenly he's one of the best players in North America. Yeah. Soon became one of the best players in the world. This guy has had one of the most meteoric rises we've seen, and it's just so funny to compare these two side by side. Their careers are just complete opposites of each other in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's so weird. I actually haven't thought about Neve's rise in a very long time. Of course, everyone remember, everyone likes to talk about how he was Terran, you know, and that's actually when Johnson was able to take a series off yeah. of him back when he was Terran. Um, and then that, that's kind of it. I kind of forget the days, you know, when the legacy of the Void beta was actually doing quite well. I think that's around the time that he fully switched to Protoss and was like, oh, wait a second. Like, I thought this guy was, hey, was, was Terran. Good. But he, I mean, he had actually made a couple of WCS qualifiers as Terran. Yeah. Like, he was... He did. But you, you're right. Like, as far as, like, actually being like, well, that's a good NA player. Because there were a ton a couple of years ago, especially Terran players. Um, not so much anymore. Uh, <laughs> only, like, a couple. Um, Getting a Protoss, playing Legacy of the Void, it just all meshed in his brain. I don't know, man. It was, as he said, a meteoric rise. And he is here looking to win BlizzCon, of all things, right, in a couple of weeks. But certainly right now looking to win uh, potentially 3-0 against Jon Snow. Yeah, Kings of the North. He wants that shield so he can shield himself from the haters at BlizzCon. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. We're hopping into our first game of this best of five. The winner's bracket semis. Here we go. On the top left. Storm John Snow. I came, came a Moss out of 
bribery for a while, but yeah. It's kind of just a joke that, you know, you talk about North American players. Whenever you talk about North American players, obviously, like, a lot of Europeans have really looked down on North America and say, oh, well, you know, there's no good North American players. And you're like, oh, well, what about Neem? And it's like, Neem's not a North American player. <laughs> Neem is Neem. We put him on his own little country with, like, wrapped like, his house around and said, this he, is now considered the land of Neem, and everything else around it can be North America. He became, he was faster to becoming a not U.S. You know, player <laughs> than Colt was in becoming a U.S. That's player. That's actually very true. Yeah, <laughs> that took some time. But uh, again, we are hyping up Eve a lot. But Johnson, I think that it is very possible for him to do something here. But it's going to be considered a massive upset if he can do something. Even he himself was kind of just saying, you know, we we're talking to him uh, before the match, like, oh, how are you feeling about this match? He's like, I don't know. I have to figure out what I'm gonna do with the lower bracket. I'm like, okay, come on, man. You gotta have some <laughs> self-confidence. Gotta build that up. But uh, I think, all jokes aside, he does still have a chance at doing something. He does. Um, and there's actually, I mean, I think of a couple of scenarios where where there is a game taken, even like a really solid macro. I don't even, I won't even be that person that's like, oh, well, maybe a cheese. You know, I actually yeah. think of a legitimate macro game. Maybe Neeb's out of position once or twice, like something concrete and, and stuff. But Neeb, man, whenever he has lost a game until uh, against people that you expect him to three zero, he has been kind of getting that revenge, that like snap back, like, nope, kid, you're gonna get three one in the most disgusting way possible. <laughs> nice little maneuver from Johnson. Doesn't quite pull Neeb out of position as he is a very solid player, but he actually moves in with the Overlord to try and draw the Stalker out of the hold position at the mm -hmm. wall, and then tries to run it with the Lings, but maybe a little bit too fast. He does escape with his Overlord, of course, and uh, the Zerglings are not gonna be able to move in, but they still scout out the Twilight Council as well as that Robo going up. Yeah, exactly. They still got a really nice scout because that, that is just right there, right? It doesn't look like Game is being very shy about letting his opponent know what's going on. So he would have, I think, maybe just barely seen that Twilight Council is also researching, but he might not expect the Dark Shrine behind it. I would say this is actually a very popular way to follow, whereas in Glaive sometimes you scout that Nexus first, and when you're like, okay, where's that Nexus? Then you think of the Dark Shrine follow up, and hopefully he'll be prepared. He'll certainly have the ability to get detection with a relatively fast layer here. It'll actually be done, uh, it's already almost halfway done, it looks like. Yeah. They're close to it. That's going to be very, very helpful, and it's it's going to be really curious because I do feel like Resonated uh. Glaive's uh, attacks have kind of fallen a little bit out of favor a bit. Like we see them occasionally, but oftentimes I feel like I see them as like seven gate adept all in, yeah. which is definitely doesn't seem like what Neeb is really looking to do right now. No, he definitely has you know the couple of gateways you would expect, but nothing too extreme. Um, Resonated Glaive is almost done. He's got a War Prism. I believe just popped flying out on the map, and he's going to send some adept shades in. Uh, John Snow, as I said, you know, he's going to have that detection for the follow-up DTs, but it's a question of like, will they even be used as DTs? They could actually be used as archons yep. to supplement an attack that Neeb thinks is going very well. Uh, and if John Snow is doing, you know, the other bad thing that can happen, which is over defend, but still take that adept damage, it is always a little bit tricky about adept all ins. Is you know, you can still get 30 drones killed no matter how prepared Ooh. you thought you were. Okay, Overlord is going to move in and actually will scout out not only the third, but also scouts out the Dark Shrine, so he's going to have some time to prepare some of those Overseers before the DTs actually come in. The Adept trying to shade in, trying to get some damage done. It looks like the DTs moving into the main base, but immediately get caught. Need with a quick pickup, though, saves all of them. Very nice. That was actually a really nice defense there. He's probably positioned, which maybe would have left his third open for the Adepts, but they weren't actually headed over there. We have Charge following this up, and they are just immediately turning into Archons. No attempt to find anything tricky. And we'll see if Neve actually is able to get any drones with these Adepts. He might play conservative from here. You know, again, if he's, his Adepts are lost too quickly, then there's that counterattack potential on his third base. Yeah, it's worth noting that, yeah, it doesn't seem like Johnson's actually taking almost any losses. He maybe loses a handful of drones over here to the Archon harassment, but for the most part, while he hasn't taken any damage, he's also invested very heavily into getting up all of these early roaches. He's getting up roach speed and everything, but he's sitting on such a low drone count, 42 drones. Now he's finally droning up a little bit more, but he really has to have a stellar defense here to really make this worth it. If he loses too many or just almost anything at this point, that's going to put him behind. Yeah, I mean, that drone count wasn't really too convincing, but he is starting to really power through here. He's also going for plus one melee, which I was wondering. We do. I feel like I see this more in the NA scene, especially we see a lot of Roach all-ins, which have just kind of faded from everywhere else, or at least that's <laughs> what it feels like. Um, but no, he actually adds on that melee upgrade. It might add on Banelings, but for now, just defending with the Hydras, or sorry, the Roaches. Wow, drone, of course, got Hydra in the brain because they've been so popular.
Yeah, this is going to be really there interesting. Neva's just constantly be on the other side of the map, whether it be with the resonating glaive attacks, whether it be with the Archon harassment, or whether it be with the charge follow up. And here we go. The War Prism still finding some good drone damage. Oh, he actually finds Whoa. drones. Moving out of position. The drones stack up. A lot of them end up falling. And oh, all that hard droning work reduced back down to 46. But Neva's also seems like he's maybe cut workers at 46. He's been there for a while. And he I has. do wonder, okay, he's resuming worker production now as he backs off of that army. Maybe just content with the damage the Archons did? Maybe. I mean, you get that many drone kills and all stacked up like that. Maybe he did feel like it was okay. Uh, he also might have just seen what the army looked like and realized he didn't actually catch Jon Snow over droning, or he was just preparing for his War Prism. I think that was more likely. He actually had moved out the sentries, moved out the Immortals, which usually is a pretty significant that they actually are planning to attack. Now, there's still that many probes there. This army is its actually a dominating army type mm -hmm. and is still a little bit up in the army supply. Okay, well... Johnso was in the right position to handle this army, but two adepts are going to be moving into the natural. Try and pull Jon Snow out of position, but Jon Snow, I was going to say he wasn't going to have any of it, but he does start to pull back and allows Neve to get into a nice spot in that mineral line. Force seals go down, trapping in a handful of these roaches and ravagers, as well as the hydras, but it seems like Jon Snow does have a decently sized army here. Will it be enough to deal with the reinforcements? Mm, I mean, the charge shots are now getting us off. Well, yeah, they're definitely getting us off of those hydras and the roaches. About half of the armies are behind the force fields, but Neve is still dominating with the rest of the Archons. His War Prism has not been touched. And in fact, a lot of those Charge Lots are still alive with barely any health on them. Oh man, Jon Snow seems like he's just losing out a little bit too much. Even with a plus one melee, it's not going to be enough. GG gets called. Jon Snow is going to tap out and me will take game number one. But the well, important thing here, Zombie Grub, is that Neve did not beat Jon Snow in game number one faster than Scarlet beat Masa. So, so far, Scarlet is still winning. In all winning. three games? <laughs> I thought, no, you didn't hear that. You weren't going that direction. All right, then. Um, yeah, uh, that's, uh, I mean, it was, a, it was a macro game, but it was one that seemed like it was the pacing. That, that's yeah. one of those games you look at the Zerg player, like, okay, the pacing was off for that Zerg player, right? Mm -hmm. Like, nothing actually catastrophic happened. Even that drone pull back into the Archons was definitely a mistake, yeah, but yeah. I wouldn't usually say the catastrophic, like 10 drones is... Yeah, it's, it's, it's not good, but um, but it was just it felt like, you know, the roaches aren't exactly reliable as yeah. the game goes on. We do it see, like of course, overly safe. I think that's the way yeah, I describe yeah, yeah, Jon sure. Snow is that it was like over commitment yeah. to the first wave of attacks. They've identified that and it was just like, cool, I'll get charged and I'll just add yeah. on like some other stuff and then come back in like three minutes. Yeah, you can't really blame Jon Snow, you know, from what he scouted, he saw an attempt in a, yeah. an attempt to attack, which didn't really, he didn't really ever send the adepts in. He only barely used the DTs and told him the Archons. So you can't blame him for trying to be prepared with roaches, which are the sturdy, safest defense you can really think of. But they definitely can cut into, again, the army's type later yeah. on where it's not that useful. And then they can cut in with that supply too and maybe even get you an inflated sense of being secure when really you see a Protoss and you're like, oh, wait a minute. They're not that great against that. Yeah, that's something that Protoss are masterful at doing, of course. But we'll see how exactly Jon Snow will respond to game number two. Like Again, I would really like to see him try and cut corners. Because, again, with a player like Neve, he is so solid. He's just such a solid all-around player that I feel like you kind of have to cut some corners against him mm. if you want to try and eke out those advantages. If you're not going to be one of those like unbelievable world-class players like Innovation, it's like you have to find some way you get ahead, and sometimes that just involves taking a risk. That's certainly true. I also was kind of thinking, um, absolutely agree, but uh, just he might have had, like we talk about the beginning of a best of five. They're both getting in there. John Snow told you a little bit of his thoughts, like I'm going <laughs> to worry about the loser's opponent, uh, opponent, but. Uh, the you know mentality of what he was expecting in the actual games was he expecting mass oracles and suddenly he saw oh, a yeah. twilight council and a robo and is like oh wait a minute like I need to completely change up my plan here go for like a, a roach more and get a faster layer for that safety against any DTs that could happen like yeah. I mean you know that could actually throw him off um, and then of course you know he goes back in oracles the next game and maybe Johnson's like oh okay wait a second he's gonna play everything isn't it. I mean, even No Regret could hardly believe that Neve has been going for some of these ground-based competitions. But now No Regret has been proven wrong. And we have uh, just concrete proof that Neve is going to be very, very versatile. You might say he's very adept at handling different types of builds. I would never say that. That's the wrong use of the word adept. <laughs> no. Um, but I, I'm actually really glad Hold to out. see that Neve, uh, Neve is going for a different style. But here we are loading in to the game. Take it away. All right. Spawning up here in the top left-hand corner of the map, we have the player from Storm Gaming. Give it up. For Storm Jon Snow. Yeah. That's that audience participation we wanted. But here we have, down in the bottom right-hand corner of the map, leading up to Series 1-0, the yellow Protoss player from Ting. Give it up for... Ting Neve. 
Wow, guys, can you please not boo on stream? <laughs> Ooh. That's a throwback to the fact that whenever people chant Neve's name, it sounds like it booing does. on the stream. But I promise you, they're just saying his name. Yeah, 100%. So I was going to talk about I'm um, glad to see that he's not just going mass oracles. I think that makes that would make him too much of a one-dimensional player, and he is probably thinking about the future a little bit here. But more important things to talk about, we did have an earlier pool from Jon Snow to knock things out. And uh, Neeb, I mean, I think his best bet, right, his safest bet is just scout every game. Like, why not? And he already has scouted how early that was. Ooh, pylon block really trying to get in Jon Snow's head and mess with him. He's going to move in and see completed spawning pool. So Lings will be out pretty soon. That pylon really won't delay too much. Much, and we may even end up seeing him cancel it just because he saw the spawning pool. And yeah, oh, actually canceling and throwing down uh -huh. another one. Being extra annoying. Indeed he is. Uh, now, John So can go for the third base. I mean, this is a typical move when you're going for a hatchery first, for instance. But the Lings, what can they really do? Um, they're not going to be backed up with anything too scary like speed or even Bane Lings. The probe <laughs> was an awkward <laughs> exchange. Uh, but the probe is even going to be able to recheck to see if, you know, it, is there gas oh. being added on? Is he going for a fast three base? Which I guess he can't because the pylon did in fact finish. Oh man, Jon Snow, he really thought that Neve was going to actually cancel that second pylon as well. But <laughs> Neve calls his bluff, lets it finish. And now his hatchery is unbelievably delayed because, yeah, there are these Lings trying to go across the map and get some light damage done, some light harassment. But this really is not anything even close to a committed attack from John Snow. It wasn't supposed to be, but uh, now he's. I just feel like he's already starting off this game behind Zombie Grub. Yeah, I kind of agree with you. That was a late, late hatchery. Uh, so, of course, it's a little bit tricky until you have that second unit, so their second zealots, or, you know, even some guys who are done. Whoa! Yeah. Whoa! Link's getting in, killing off one of the zealots. This is a good start for Zarn Snow, and a couple more Link's also going to sneak their way in. Could go after the pylon, split up the attention of that zealot. One of the Link's does go down, but the rest of the Link's, uh, well, they don't have Zergling speed just yet, yeah. so it's going to be hard to run away from that Mothership core. They actually are so injured, too, that a pro pull would be really, I think, even easy. A little bit of micro you see right there. He's pulling back the weak probes, and that was the easy easiest little cleanup there. Jon Snow re hoping that he had been given a gift ends up just not doing very much and now has to deal with a Protoss player that got a Mothership Core and two gateways before leaving to get on a Nexus. Like, he probably knew he could have and he could have played like the macro game beyond that early pool, but instead he's actually going to be able to cause some problems for Jon Snow who has to make Lings to defend. Uh, yeah, Lings to defend. I almost feel like he might even need to make Lings to try and counter all in or something at this point because he just feels like he's falling further and further behind. He still doesn't even have a third, and we're now hitting past the three-minute mark. Adepts are now making their way in. The pylon's finishing up, which could actually be focused on overcharge and make it even more difficult to do anything over here. Things yeah. are just spiraling out of control right now. In a way, this could even backfire on Neeb. It looks like Jon Snow, you said he didn't even have a third base. Oh, that's... That's actually terrifying that oh. he got a couple of shots off. But if Jon Snow is going to go for a follow-up two-base all-in, then taking out these units as fast as possible might have worked in his favor. Yeah. Unfortunately, what happens there is Jon Snow just looks like he deals with it. Neeb is like, okay, you dealt with that. I'm going to back off. When in an alternate universe, maybe the recall is late and he loses those units, and then Jon Snow, uh, actually, the recall. I don't think he lost any units late. there. Can we actually I don't check think the so. units lost tab? To something? Shift Shift out. Yeah, there we go. Uh, uh, okay, okay, so he did, lose, he did lose that one earlier Zealot in the pylon yeah, that he used for the, the block. But, but anyways, a different universe. Maybe Jon Snow has a really decent chance of this all in. But now Need does have units at the very least, like some units. And it's going into a Stargate, which can be very helpful dealing with either the drops, go to Phoenix, take out the Overlord or an Oracle to help with the Lings. But he also has double gateway production. So once he realizes like how committed this really is, he, I think he'll be okay. Yeah, and even if somehow Jon Snow decides, actually, I'm not going to commit to this, this is still going to be a huge problem right now for him because defending the low ground third base and without any creep to connect the main and the third, that's going to be incredibly difficult against the Stargate opening. If he can't break through over here, this actually just might be curtains for Jon Snow in game number two. Huh, this is not a great sign when they already have those two adepts in the mm. main base. Oh, God, he's one-shotting the Lings as they come out. Okay, this is really oh, not going no. well. Oh, no, even a little bit of micro. Wow. That one adept actually saves it. The other one is eventually going to go down, but the Oracle has popped out to take care of the rest of the Lings, and Jon Snow is just hoping that Neeb makes the mistake. There's nothing more that he can do. I mean, I really feel like this is Jon Snow trying to now break Neve, and he's got this little paintball gun, and Neve is just this hard brick wall that says, I really don't care. I'm just I'm going to come across the map, and I'm going to just flatten you. Yeah, now he's going to go for Mass Oracle, the double Stargate, and, of course, Jon Snow might be thinking, well, maybe I have a macro game in this. He's going to get 
zapped to death because I don't think he has that many extra queens. So he's building some right now. Wants to get an attempt at the break, uh -oh. but there's going to be even maybe a triple or a quadruple wall off. <laughs> like, yeah, keep I mean, go, keep going, Neeb. Go for the four walls. Neeb has lived with the one and only no regret. <laughs> Just flooding Lings as a strategy. He has already, I'm sure, lost at least once two before, and he's not going to let it happen again. Yeah, I'd love how many pylons there are. <laughs> Somebody's score does go down, but the targets are already built. So I Tower do... defense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Make a maze next time, see if you can get it. Um, but it's not even about the gateway production anymore. So the Semex score sometimes a big grab. Doesn't matter. You can still make oracles. The targets are done, and the queens are only going to be able to do so much uh, trying to make this a macro game. Yeah, as the oracles make their way across the map, this is really difficult. Even these two oracles could probably just take on one of the queens if there's just one queen sitting over at this base. I don't believe there's any spore cores. If there are spore cores, then the damage has already been done. But guess what? There are, there's nothing there. It's these two <laughs> queens in the main, which cannot actually help with the defense over at that low ground base. So as soon as Neeb moves in over here, this... Uh, okay, well, there's two queens over there at the... Well, I don't even, I want to call it a natural, but it's not a natural. It's just their second base. The least natural, natural. The least, even it's a very unnatural there. base. Yeah, that is a lot of links. The oracles will probably have to come back and help out. Actually, I think he has sentry, so they might even have to, to do that. They can just show around. Photon overcharge zombie grub. Oh. Enjoy while it lasts. What a useful spell. Yeah, I know <laughs> we have shield batteries. Oh, man, the void rail also adding in some extra DPS. It is getting focus fired down, but the oracle's still going to reign supreme at the end of the day, I imagine. As the queens are out of transfuse energy, the oracles do quite a bit of damage. And now the drones and, uh, are going to be under attack, and the Lings are unable to break through. GG! GG. Neeb secures himself a 2-0 lead in this best of five. Looks unfazed, looks almost a little bored. <laughs> That's not too uncommon. He sometimes looks pretty bored. But it's, it's going to be hard. You know, we brought up something risky, right, that Johnson has to do as, you know, mm -hmm. to put it bluntly, the worst player, as yeah. that is. Uh, but unfortunately, going for any type of those early cheeses is just something that is so easy for a guy like Neeb to scout, right? Because mm -hmm. he just literally says, like, oh, the only way I can maybe die is I don't scout something. So I'll just send a pro, which really isn't too much skin off his back, you know? Like, that's not a big deal for him. Yeah. He even does it usually, so. Yeah, it works out great. It's actually just so funny. I feel like Jon Snow has been smiling more during this series than Neeb. He almost just seems content with saying, yeah, I'm going to throw some things at him. We'll see what sticks. And if it doesn't, then uh, so be it. It's still the winner's yeah. match, but... Uh, it really would, I think, be a lot. Even just a self-confidence boost if you take a game off of Neeb. You don't want to get 3-0 because that's always like, whether or not it's Neeb, yes, I understand. It's Neeb. People will be okay and understand losing to the literal god and the favorite for the tournament. But at the same time, you never want to go into the loser's bracket just getting 3 0 no matter who it's against. Yes, that is true. And Johnson has taken a game before, mm -hmm. so... It is possible, and I'm thinking more towards things that are a little bit harder to scout. You know, yeah. there are those early game things, you know, the proxy pylons, the proxy racks. Like, you can actually literally scout those. Yeah, but switch to Protoss right before the <laughs> countdown ends and just go for the well, cannon rush. My, my idea is that you can literally work or scout those, yes. right, if you look fast enough. But, you know, some of those, like, three base hydro busts, you know, bring those back. You know, something a little bit trickier that, that Nia might not actually be scouting for. I think that he's in total control as a macro game, something yeah. is his element, and then just be like, bam, actually, no. Uh, even like a three base, don't drone it, Ling Baneling all in. It's These are old school things that have mostly been phased out and a lot because Protoss players have just learned to deal with them even without knowing they're on mm -hmm. their way. But maybe that's where the win comes from. That's also one thing about Neve that is worth noting is that he is a player, he is a world-class player. But one of the kind of weird downsides about being a world-class player is a world-class player is always looking to try and cut as many corners as possible. Yeah. One of the things that Neve is very well known for is delaying his mothership core. Because he says, well, if I just micro perfectly, I can defend without putting overcharge against a lot of those early elements until I get up my mothership core. So yeah. because he has that delayed mothership core, that also makes him susceptible to some kind of all-ins early on. That, Like you said, if he has a hard time scouting, it could actually work out well. Yeah, I, it just seems so unfortunate, though, because that was his biggest weakness. Yeah. And you know how he... The first way that he defended against it, he started building Mothership Cores, like, bravo. But then the second <laughs> way that he wanted to defend against it was just actually having units in position. Yeah. He actually would still delay his Mothership Core because he just learned how to better defend, even without the scout. So that always is kind of like a bummer, I think, for a lot of <laughs> players. They're like, well, we had one way to defeat this guy, now we don't. I think it's one of my favorite things about me. People always wonder, how did he get so good? And if you actually talk to him or you talk to some people who've, uh, like, listen to how he ladders and everything. The way he actually plays is he has a notebook. And every time he loses a game, he writes it down, and he just doesn't lose to that anymore. And that's yeah. one of the frustrating things about playing versus Neem. He will not make the same mistake that many times. But 
Here we go. This guy has got to capitalize on something, some mistake that his opponent makes. Spawn down here in the bottom left-hand corner of the map. We have the red Side reserve Storm, player from Sidestorm Gaming. Give it up for... And his opponent spawning up here in the top right-hand corner of the map, leading up the series 2-0, to zero, representing Ting. Give it up for... Ting Ni. I like it. We got the chance. He knows <laughs> That's a great chant. I really wonder if he's ever going to get tired of that meme, Jon Snow. He really brought it on himself. Yeah. I mean, I you know, I was really careful that Zombie Grub could only be made fun of one way, you know, and not become a meme. Zerk Girl? Zombie no, Girl? No, that's your thing. <laughs> the correct way to make fun of my name is called me Zombie Scrub. Zombie thank, Scrub. Thank you very uh, much. Okay. But, I uh, actually have a list of things that annoy Zombie Grub. And he, he does, Oh, actually. it's great. There he are does. so many ways that you can annoy And I her. get back at you by making you watch horror movies. Yes, you do. That was a horrible movie you made me watch. It was a great movie. Anyways, <laughs> um, so we have a probe scout early again, right? Like, he is going to be on guard, wondering if John so is going to just try and, you know, catch him is that? being content. Okay, the hatchery's on. Sometimes I just have, like, that, that seventh sense that a hatchery is off location. The seventh sense? Yeah, I don't have a sixth sense. <laughs> Is uh, that because it's the wrong sense? Like you get it wrong every time? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> All right, yeah. yeah. I think I think he's got it on okay. location. Yeah. Um, anyway, so he does scout. Like that's something that's not going to trick any Protoss player anymore. There was a time where you weren't taking that as your yeah. natural base, and you're like, oh, what was happening? What's happening? Am I getting one base all in? Yeah, yeah. not anymore. So it is going to be more of those other things we're talking about. So they're more akin to the, like, the mid game all ins. They're just, tr again, trying to play a, a more solid mid game that you actually. Um, bring even to the late game, you know, like that you get the opportunity to go Ling, Bane, Ling, Hydra, and then mm -hmm. you get the opportunity to put pressure on Need because both games now, I guess he tried last game with the pure Lings, too early, too all in, too obvious. The game before that, he had those roaches that really just mm -hmm. felt like, not a waste, you can't say they were a waste, but they were defensive and didn't help much. Yeah, it's going to be really difficult. He's got to find something, whether it be making it to the mid game or finding some other way to put the pressure on Need. but Need is going to be sending out his first adept trying to get a bit of scouting information on his opponent while he gets up that Stargate behind this. Uh, just a single Stargate for now, and there are multiple ways that press players can open up into the Mass Oracle style, or they can just throw down one Stargate, get out the two Oracles, which is what they used to do, uh -huh. and then maybe sometimes go for a Phoenix and go straight into like a big Adept or Charge Lot army, just a big variety of things. Yeah. There are so many ways to go into Mass Oracle, actually. I'm glad you brought mm -hmm. that up. And, and I think one of the ways that Neves really likes doing it is the two Oracles in the Voidery, mm -hmm. which I think is what he did last game. Um, but there's, yeah, there's, there's other ways. And he could just not go into Mass Oracles. And yeah. Could, you know, go right into that charge like you were talking about. The way that we, Protoss was being played until mm -hmm. Mass Oracles made it in. But Jon Snow, I'm sure, is going to be a little on guard against that, too. Uh, he's actually had to deal mm -hmm. with two Adepts first. Well, Adepts already finding a couple of kills. Some nice focus fire from Neeb. Also soaking up the hits from those Lings on the more healthy Adept. And gets out of there with both of them. Those shields were recharged. And... He'll get a lot more value out of them uh, later on. But a couple of more gateways being added on. With the Oracle now out and a Phoenix on the way, I believe, uh, it seems like Neeb is going to be well situated to move into a nice little ground game for the mid game. Mm, okay. Uh, so third base should be coming down, or he should be planning on taking the third base soon. I think he's already got a probe over there. The Oracle is going to be able to not just harass a little bit, but also have that great scouting. So oh. if Jon Snow gets a massive unit, we'll see what type mm -hmm. and how fast. Yeah. There's that third base coming down. Nice little defense so far from Jon Snow. Pushing back that Oracle. It even loses a bit of its hit points beyond the shields, which is going to make it harder to move back in later. So it might be a little bit easier for Jon Snow to help defend later on as well. But Ling's trying to find that third. They do find it, but unfortunately the deaths are going to be there. And I think he's just a little bit afraid of the Photon Overcharge, put, killing off too many of those Lings. So he just does back up. Yeah, you need to commit to that if they already have the Adepts and the pile mm -hmm. on there. Uh, we do have a Forge on the way, so at this point in time, not going to be any of those quick mm -hmm. Oracle shenanigans, which Jon Snow, I don't think he's actually gotten much scouting. He saw the third timing, but that doesn't really tell you too much other than, hey, it's on a mm -hmm. depth island or something like that. And of course, Ooh. the Oracle already showed that. All right, the low drone king, though, making a handful more lings at just 38 or 39 drones right now. This is something that Jon Snow used to be really well known for, just cutting workers, maybe a few, five to six workers, before a lot of other players would. A lot of players would drone up to like maybe 45, 46 workers, then really start popping out a ton of units, but he's going to try and get them up a little bit earlier on. Uh, we'll see if he's going to be able to do much with them, though, because I don't believe he has a Baneling Nest. I don't believe he has a Roach Warren. Uh -huh. This is just going to be against really strong Adepts. 
his plan here might be to just dominate the adept force and then do a counterattack on that mm -hmm. third base before the adept, the oh, reinforcing adept. That's a good start. Can come in. So this is a really great start. Wow, he gets all of them. I think yeah, he gets all of them. That was a really efficient trade. And sometimes Neve does not commit to that, but I don't think he expected as many lings as there were. Maybe his Oracle had seen them a little bit too late. So now the lings do have their opportunity to try and get in here. A sentry and a couple of uh, pylons, but is the militia core even? Is he even here? Is he even made it? Oh, there okay, it is. Okay, it is there. It has one foot and overcharge available, but that means that there's not going to be nothing over at the natural. There is an adept over at the wall and a probe over there ready to position and build a pylon to complete that wall. And once again, there it is. But Jon Snow still tries to commit in over there. He does force the Oracle to also use its remaining energy, so that's one less kind of worry while he drones up behind this. I, I, I don't know. I didn't really hate the attack that much. He did manage to get up to a decent worker count, but he didn't really seem to get a lot of damage done. Yeah, he's actually still behind after mm -hmm. pumping out a lot of a lot of drones. So I would say that wasn't too worthwhile. Of course, the Lings will be used in the army later on. It's not completely worth this, worthless, but mm -hmm. definitely was hoping for a mistake, again, from the, like, not enough pylons, but of course, it hasn't been made or... Oh, okay, yeah. almost found an opportunity to jump on those sentries, but expecting those force fields to be a little bit too strong from Neve does end up backing out. He grabs his fourth. He's up to a fairly healthy count now, but this is where double robotics facility production begins, and this is where things start getting really dangerous for any Zerg player. Yeah, you know, I was, like, looking at the production tab, noting, like, wait a second, you got an upgrade, but no toilet council upgrade mm. all the way. What is this? And, yeah, he had gone for those double robos, so an interesting way to, to mix up the style. You know, we mm -hmm. do have those mass immortal games months ago where that was the primary thing to do into charge. But he's actually adding the robotics bay as well, so, I mean, bringing back Colossus, bring bring his Raptors back in. He's getting Blink, finally, from that Twilight Council. Maybe an ode to M. Canning, just to say, <laughs> hey, you know what, we'll still make Disruptors work while they still last, but uh, we'll have yeah. to wait and see what he actually decides to do once that Robotics Bay is uh, finished up. Yeah, not, not too many Protoss players are going for Colossus, but it's something Ooh. that, yeah, there we go, it's Colossus. <laughs> it's something that seems to be occasionally, like, maybe there's some secret Protoss group, and they're like, yeah, I think I could I, make it so work. So I think the thing I like about uh, Colossus is against a lot of Zerg players who just have been going for this Ling Bane Hydra style, yeah. Colossus yeah. are incredibly effective. They do great versus the Lings. They shred the Banelings was... before they make the connections. And the Hydras have always been considered a unit that does not fare very well versus Colossus in large numbers. Yeah, there was a couple, uh, a few months ago, I want to say that there was a pretty mm -hmm. famous GSL or SSL, something like that, yeah. where, where someone did go Colossus, right? Mm -hmm. And it ended up being a pretty perfect counter, especially to the timing at which Ling Hydra Baneling was trying to push mm -hmm. into you. Because, of course, with Colossus, you, there's a, there's a build-up to a very strong army, but it's very small. And in the beginning, you mess up your force field. You could be dead. Yeah. But but by the time that Johnson's actually ready to push, he might have two, maybe the th third and fourth one even on the way. And that's a lot of DPS. Yeah, I think the other big fear, and the reason why Colossus really fell out of fashion in the ooh. first place was the Vipers, but uh, ooh, a lot of banelings being made. I'm uh, looking at the double transport overloads that were just made. It could oh. just be for drops in the main and the third days. I like that. Neve is not looking, but he is, uh, Colossus are on the way. There Ooh, they are. Could be setting up for a kind of nice flank, but there's a stasis trap over there. The Lings are, g one Ling sets it off and catches a few units over there. The Bane Lings almost make some beautiful connections. They soften up a lot of these units, but is it going to be enough? These Colossus getting some good damage done. Jon Snow closing. This is, might actually be able to kill off all these sentries. Whoa. Nice pickup from the War Prism, though. Salvages it, but is he going to be losing his fourth base in the process? It looks like the answer is yes. Yeah, busting knee before Jon Snow was maxed out actually ended up being fantastic. There was not enough units in, as I said, like that smaller army mm -hmm. while you're still building up. This at third and fourth Colossus weren't on the way, and that fourth base had to be canceled, but it was a cancel, and he saved his Colossus. He saved the sentries at the last second. He can replace the Stalkers relatively okay Ooh. with a strong three base. Going for the Spire behind this. I wonder if he's just going to be making Corruptors as an answer, or if this is just going to wow. be him going into Mutas. That'd be like Wings of Liberty style, man. I can just hear just dubstep in the background <laughs> as he flies his Corruptors over storms. Oh, God. <laughs> well, let's, ho let's hopefully not see that happen. But here co we go. Bailey drops coming on into the third. Neve doesn't seem to be paying attention right now. He's going to end up losing a ton of these workers as plus two melee bailings one shot all those workers. Very nicely done. I think he has another one wow. somewhere else. The fourth base is going to be canceled again. 
uh, he does. It might like go into that natural base. So Neve is a tough decision, you know, actually going forward with the army. He'd be going on a creep without a recall. He better be oh, prepared to take a fight. That's a lot of banelings. The force fields do come down, and those colossus are shredding so many banelings right there. But it seems like Neve with the colossus, oh my god, he might actually just have a little bit too much. Those force fields were so key in helping him defend. That was so close. I thought he was going to be out of force fields. That last one that popped down saved, I think, the entrance to his colossus and his sentries. And now he is pushing forward. Getting another army like that for Jon Snow oh. is going to take time. He has a couple of banelings, like a good amount, and they might be able to get some great connections. But now we're onto the stalkers as well. You know, they can actually split, they can blink apart, and the Colossus, four of them, will go through any part of this army very quickly. Uh, okay, well, we do have those Corruptors coming on out. They're going to be helpful for trying to deal with this Colossus. It looks like he's also maybe making some more drop overlords to try and drop on top of this army. That might be a little bit dangerous with how many Stalkers there are inside of this army of Neeb. Seems like we still have that one bailing drop that's ready to move in, but not quite find the opportunity. Here we go, and this is going to be so critical. How good are the connections on these bailings? for Jon Snow. Oh, there was a stasis trap oh, that was God. actually put down that actually made almost a wall. Uh, it means force fields. Yeah, yeah, instead of force fields. The sentries are actually still secure in the back. They're not really useful right now, but he still wants to save them so they'll gain energy. The stalkers, if oh, they take out the bailings, it won't be so bad. And there's just not enough drop overlords to really make drop bailings work. Oh, God, those are empty drop overlords that are definitely <laughs> not going to be very useful over here. Drones being evacuated. Jon Snow being reduced that back down to three bases and barely even mining off of those three bases at this point. He might have 76 workers. He may have been doing a great job of keeping those alive, but he has to clean up this army of Neve, who is not actually reprobing, so he still has an opportunity here, but he's got to take a great engagement. Colossus getting hit by those Corruptors, and they are actually finding some pretty good damage, but the Hydras are getting roasted behind it. Yeah, the thing is, even if he had taken out the Colossus, GG, there are so many Blink Stalkers behind it. He still would have been overrun. And in the closest game we've seen so far today, uh, Neeb does manage to take the 3-0 over Jon Snow. It was still a really cool last game. I feel like Jon Snow was so close. He was so close to taking that last game. But just that one engagement, that one engagement turned everything around. There were two engagements where if those force fields weren't put down, mm -hmm. if the sentries weren't picked up, that Neeb actually might lose his army and have to rebuild mostly Stalkers, which once they're in the mass of 30, as they were in the late game when we mm -hmm. saw at the end there, like, okay, fine. But at the very beginning when he was almost losing to those Banelings, there's like, <laughs> like you know, eight of them. He yeah. actually could have been overwhelmed. I almost wonder, like, if at that point your opponent has used all the four seals, do you think that like the correct decision was just to pull back. You might not even get an opportunity like that again. Otherwise, it's uh, it's so it's such a hard decision to make in the yeah, spot. You pull back, they warp in eight more soccer. Yeah, exactly. Know? Or and, and even just more sentries. Like, they have more yeah, force fields yeah, available. Exactly. Like they're yeah. they're creating a barrier of some type. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, there's actually a lot of things to talk about in that game. The the corruptors being made. The fact oh, that yeah. it was Colossus. Like they both played. Well, I, mean, I think Need played the more interesting style there, mm -hmm. but John Snow's response to it, you know, I kind of made that joke yeah. it was Liberty, but it was very true. Like, we don't see Corruptors against Colossus in this matchup like, anymore. Yeah, it's really, really not seen very much, but we may be seeing more of it because that does mean with Neeb advancing on, we will be seeing the one and only Neeb facing off versus Scarlet, Old Blood versus New Blood. Uh, can we even call Neeb New Blood anymore? I feel like not, maybe uh, not. I guess so. Like, it's it's, it's kind of new generation versus old generation in a way. I suppose. Yeah, it's right. actually this is a weird dynamic. They're actually so close, right? Like, yeah. you know, they're friends and their personality is kind of similar. They're really that far apart age wise, but it's really <laughs> hard to differentiate them too much. Get that one's pretty awesome, one's work. Yeah. But, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be hopping over to the analyst couch in just a little bit to hear their thoughts, to see what they thought of that series, as I'm sure they have many, many thoughts on that three Zerg player couch. But uh, we'll see you guys over there. Take it away, Jake. Thanks, Ravi. I'm here with my boys, Dave, and I don't remember your name. Just kidding, it's <laughs> Penguin. Uh, we had some pretty interesting games. I really thought that was a very interesting play style from those last couple games, especially yeah. the most recent mm -hmm. one. Yeah, for sure. That um, that felt like we just time traveled a little bit. Yeah. Uh, first game uh, felt like we time traveled back about maybe six, eight, nine months. Mm -hmm. uh, second game felt like we time traveled back maybe, uh, maybe you know, like three to four months. And then the game before that felt like we went back about two and a half years. Yeah, that, um, that was interesting. Yeah. I've actually seen um, some people in Korea do some Colossus playstyles. Yeah. Uh, it is kind of coming back with the whole Ling Hydra Bane style. Like, it really yes. isn't that bad, the Colossi style. It's not 
amazing, it, but it is playable. It's, it's a sure. way of it's a way of dealing with it. Um, the, the the reason we mostly don't see it that much though is because, uh, ironically, something we barely saw at all that series. Uh, the oracles are just so good at dealing with uh, the Ling Bane Hydra, especially if you go for melee attacks, which is what uh, Jon Snow was doing. Uh, but yeah, we didn't really see any of the. Uh, I want to say. I want to say Neeb was completely hiding his cards for BlizzCon with that series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Possible. I do think that the, the Colossi style, while it's not as common and as, and as standard as the other play styles, whether it be Ground or Oracles, it still definitely does have its place. It gives you a very, very strong push, as we saw there in that last game. It gives you a lot of power to go for that pre-Hive, pre-Broodlord timing push, where it really starts to fall off, is that you don't really have any counter to the Broodlords when yes. the Zerg eventually gets there. Whereas, if we're talking about Storm, like there's ways that you can work around that. If you have Storm, there's ways that you can work around it. If you have Oracles, and you can already just very easily go into Void Razor Tempest. So, yeah. that's sort of the downfall of that style. But when you can go for that kind of a really strong push to just hit the Zerg before they get there, it really allows the Protoss to just try to go for that final blow very early on. Yeah. Our Protoss um, do enjoy blowing. <laughs> and there you have it. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but I, wa I really want to reiterate that this was not a standard PvZ by any stretch of the imagination. It was very, uh, very offbeat. Uh, mm -hmm. We saw a little bit, parts of the games were uh, a little more standard, so like I, opening in game three was standard. Middle I've, of game I've, two. I've lived with Alex for like a year or so, and I haven't seen him practice these styles at all. So mm. I would have to say it's definitely like a variation that he knows works, but hasn't practiced. Yep. Either yeah. he's trying to hide it for the finals of this tournament, or he's Ooh. hiding it for BlizzCon or whatever. Definitely Which is still, these styles are not like he's never seen it. He's like, you know what? I'm going to build a Colossus. <laughs> what now? <laughs> what does like, this unit do? Yeah, John Snow's not going to know what this unit is. Like, he knows yeah. that these styles are playable. He's yeah. studied them for sure, so. Mm. Yeah. Um, I also want to point out that uh, I'm pretty sure you swapped in for, uh, for Jon Snow in the second game, because that looked very similar to a game you might play. Uh, yeah. Only 19 drones, uh, two bases at, I believe, the seven or eight minute mark. Jon Snow uh, actually really loves Tanib. that build, though. He's really been uh, a fan of having the ZVP Ling Drop, Ling Flood all in, in, his, uh, in his back pocket for yeah. really as long as he's been on Storm at least. Like he, I'll regularly see him busted out in tournaments, and that's a lot of that, that code S inspiration. You know, a lot of foreigners, they like to watch the Korean tournaments for builds and inspiration, so definitely right. Jake's inspiration there. Jon Snow definitely stayed up till 4 a.m. to watch Jake's yep. groups. Yep, probably. And um, yeah, that was, that was just really textbook play from Neeb in terms of mechanics. Uh, so, yeah, game two, the wall-off was brilliant. Uh, controlling the Zealots was really good. Uh, Microing around those Adepts to keep them alive against the Ling drop, really nice. Uh, game three, uh, you talked about this a little bit. There was a big engagement. Uh, Neeb had just wiped out, or sorry, Neeb had just lost uh, probably 16 or 18 probes right. at his third base. Uh, army supplies were pretty even. Uh, it was looking like Jon Snow might actually be able to get on the board and take down that game. Right. And uh, he was pushing in with those Banelings towards the Colossus, and there was no force field, so Jon Snow committed, and then right before they were about to contact, boom, perfect force field. Blocks right. out all of the Banelings, it was, and they're perfectly stacked up to get smashed by the Colossus. It was very delayed. I think he even may have let a couple Banes through, like the first couple force fields. Very few, maybe one or two. And it kind of looked like uh, Jon Snow might be able to, like, jump on the army. Yeah. So he had like this dilemma where he, if he retreats the Colossus, they're going to swipe down the bands. Yep. Whereas he might be able to get a connection. Obviously, we know that didn't happen. Yes. Uh, he went for the gamble. It, it didn't pay off. But like, what can you do in that position anyways? And I mean, especially I mean, you're if you're Neeb. playing against somebody like Neeb at some point, at some point in the game, you're going to have to take a gamble because Neeb yeah. is just so good mechanically yeah. and he's so solid. So, I mean, it, it's I liked his, I just because the gamble... Idea. Like, the whole Bane drop idea later on, too, was good. Yes, yeah. But at the same time... Uh, he just didn't have enough, I don't think. Right. Yeah. It was, like, one Bane Yeah, it, no, it, was, it was one Overlord. If and then there was three Overlords behind it, like, a yeah. little bit awkwardly. So if he'd, uh, if he'd saved... He lost, I think, probably 25, 30 Banes uh, running into those Force Seals. If he'd save those, if those goes in in five, six Overlords worth of Banelings, mm -hmm. I don't care how many Blink Stalkers you get, you're going to do some damage to that army, and you're going to do some important damage if to he, the sentries. If he killed that army, that would have been a very game... Like, like oh, it would. I oh, think yeah, that would have been absolutely. game like, over. Like that army sure. is not easily replaced. No, so. especially when he was down and to 50 probes. And it also doesn't have a retreat ability. Like a no. lot of uh, Oracle play styles, you can just back up. Yeah. Shit's going south. You just leave. But you can't do that with this army. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we didn't see that. I'm not actually sure what we're supposed to do after this. Uh. Well, I mean, like, we got to live our lives one I, day at a thank time. Thank you. 
Yeah. yeah. I appreciate that. I was thought I wasn't going to live my life after this, but thank you. Well, um, I mean, after seeing how badly that Zerg got smashed. we're going to be doing a loser's been. interview and then a winner's interview. So, short break, and then we're coming back with a loser. Hope everybody's deaf now. Let's take it away. Commercial. What's up, guys? No regret here coming at you with another loser. <laughs> I'm here with Jared. Yeah, it's okay, man. We no. feel your pain. No one here was surprised. Okay. I, I wasn't surprised either. But. It's Protoss. It's a tough world out there. Okay. He didn't oracle you though. 
So no. that's nice. How do you feel about your games? Uh, probably, probably the worst games of my life. Uh, <laughs> I feel that. That's just how it feels when you play Neve, though. He makes it feel like that because he's just so good. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just uh, nothing really went as planned. He definitely surprised me with no oracles. It's okay. But I should have expected the no oracles, so that was my bad. Did I don't, he didn't oracle you though? Yeah, I should have expected no oracles. Why? Because he, he loves known. his oracles. He should have known I would have expected oracles. <laughs> the double mind game. Right. I should expect. I should have. You should have expected him to not go oracles. Yeah. So you're I'm saying that you played a specifically to play against oracles? That's what you did. You metagamed that? Um, I mean. Not really, because you could well, see it wasn't oracles. Really, there was a the problem game. here. I would have <laughs> didn't metagame. metagame oracles. I would So have why would you? You're gonna say you you were gonna metagame not going oracles? No, no. It's like I was gonna metagame oracles, but then I see like a robo and a twilight like uh -huh. five minutes in the game, so you know it's not. So oracles. then you metagame not going oracles. Yeah, but no, it's just scouting. What is your point? The point is, if I saw nothing, I would have thought oracles, but I kept seeing something that wasn't. Right. That's mass what. Oracle. That's what. You know All that's right, called? so I Scouting. have an important I question know. for Jared. Game two, how much of that build was inspired by your study of GSL Code S, No Regrets, GSL Play? Um, a little bit. Is he your favorite player? Definitely my favorite player, no doubt. All my builds come from him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll so take credit for that. Yeah. Actually, wait, you lost. Nope. Yeah, that was <laughs> all you. It wasn't, it wasn't his build, I lost with it. <clears throat> so you came from Korea a couple months ago, right? Yeah. You didn't take any of that knowledge from Alex living there to this tournament? Like, you, you guys were pretty close you're together. You're so harsh, Jake. What? No, I don't, I don't look at his, <laughs> his like, builds Study. every day. He changes every, every day. He, he gets he, better. I, he does. He definitely, I've, been, I've never seen him play that style, so I can't. Um, have you ever seen him play it with the Colossus style? I've never seen that from him. Know, I've not, seen no. it, but I have never seen it from yeah, him. Yeah, I haven't seen him in any games. So he definitely surprised me with that. I didn't even scout for it. I, didn't, I, I messed up a lot of scouting. Game one and game three. Right. So are you gonna how are you gonna like prepare for your next match? Like on Semper? Yeah. Well, I play right now. Yeah, so how you just gonna beat him. Oh you, you don't even have him? a break? Alright, so you Do you wanna say something to him? Momentum. Semper, where are you? <coughs> you ready to say Oh yeah, he's say got his accent. he's got his noise cancelling headphones on, so you can uh, say whatever you want about anything. him and he's never anything gonna you know. want. Uh Semper's a pretty good player, it's gonna be a fun no, series, no, no, no. you know. Wow. <laughs> Alright. Original. We're going to throw it off to a winner's interview with our winner, Alex Sunderhalf For and now. Ravi. 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 Thank you so much, GSL Code S participant, no regret. I'm joined by Alex Sunderhalf, also known as Standard Sunderhaft and Average Alex. How are you doing today, Neeb? I'm doing pretty good so far. So you just had a really, really awesome 3-0 victory over Jon Snow, but I think like the first two games looked pretty straightforward. The third game definitely got a little bit uh, hectic. Yeah, I didn't really have a planned strategy for the third game. I planned something for the first and second game, so I was just kind of thinking on the fly, and I don't know. I don't think I made that good of choices. Like my, so you were my just styling on Jon Snow. <laughs> Not really, because it was quite close, but... You just said, I can do whatever I want versus this guy, and I'll win at this point. Well, he, he should have won that game, but I, I don't know. Like, I guess he just underestimated the Colossus a little bit. He fought a little bit too early, like in the middle near the Watchtower. Like, if he just sat back and waited for, like, ten Corruptors, and yeah. just go in and it's easy. Yeah, you had some really sick force fields that uh, kept all those banelings out and everything. A really nice job. But your next match is going to be versus Scarlet, who I think is someone that you're pretty good friends with and everything. So how are you feeling about that match? Uh, I think it'll definitely be a hard match, but I've been practicing PvZ a lot, so uh, I'm pretty confident if I prepare and uh, like I'm in the right mindset and everything. Do you feel like she has a pretty good read on like your style and everything, just because you guys talk and play a lot? Yeah, and she all ends me all the time, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, like I know what she does too. So awesome! Yeah, all right, I want even. I want to hear so uh, score predictions for that series. Uh, maybe 3-1. Three, 3-1? One. Three, one. Either way, I don't know. Either way? Yeah, oh, so you a, think like, Scarlet might beat you? I don't know. If one of us gets, like, some momentum going. And mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much, Neeb. We're going to be hopping to a short little commercial break, so we'll see you guys in just a little bit with more Kings of the North action.